Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm just adjusting myself here. Uh, where do you stand? Where do you sit? Uh, quite often, if people see me with a mic in my hand, I usually start singing. But uh, not not today. Uh, my name is Archie. I'm an alcoholic. And it is a pleasure to be here today. And it's uh, also a great pleasure to see some of the people who uh, actually traveled because I knew I was speaking here today. Not many, two or three, two or three. <laughs> uh, but and that's based more on the uh, on the friendship we go back many many years, which is uh, a wonderful thing of this fellowship. I, uh, you know, I was just thinking that sitting there and I was trying to gather my thoughts and you know send out a few uh, thoughts to the person, uh, the my heart power which is not that far removed from the God of my childhood. I, uh, just thinking in terms of, first time I was asked to speak at uh, a gathering above a, you know, say 10 or 12 people, uh, was on a little convention in Belfast. I get sober in Belfast, you can tell from the accent. I'm not from London. I've lived in London for many years. But I, I was born in Belfast. I get sober in Belfast. And, uh, I was asked to speak at this little convention, you know, it was maybe, I don't know, 60, 70 people, because it was many years ago. AA wasn't as large as it is today. And I I said to my sponsor, "Uh, John, I'm very nervous, you know. Uh, What do you think I should talk about? And, you know, uh, he said, well, look, you know, you're among your friends, you're among AA people. Tell them, tell them how you feel. So I got up to the mic and I said, well, my name's Nervous, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I've moved on a little bit from there, <laughs> a little bit. But uh, so the wonderful thing is, too, that I, uh, for a kid who started off uh, life in an ordinary working class home in Belfast, I was the youngest of family of three, I was the only boy. I was spoiled by typical Irish matriarch, you know, which really for me today is a wonderful gift. Especially at times, you know, as I sponsor people, I listen to people share, and I think, oh, they had a rough childhood. I didn't have that. But yet alcohol found me, and once it put its hook into me, I was gone down the road until I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I, I started off with uh, different skills, and the skills were uh, varied, you know, but by and large, I, uh, I was quite successful in, in sales, done quite well in sales. Uh, but along the way, the alcohol started to unfold, it started to show, uh, and, you know, around about the age of uh, 18, I experienced my first blackout. Uh, now, prior to that, if someone had said to me about a blackout, you know, I was, I'm old enough to remember the blackouts during the, the war period. Not very well, but, you know, you used to hear uh, parents talk about the blackouts and stuff like that. But I didn't realize that I could actually be out somewhere, operate, and, you know, run about for a couple of hours, not know where I've been, what I've done. How did I get this cracked rib, you know? How come my chin sore? You know, how come I've got a black eye? Not because it was very tough, or, well, I suppose if I had been very tough, I wouldn't have had black eyes and <laughs> broken ribs. You know, but uh, it was a part of my life that really I was volunteering with to alcohol. Now, the information was there right from the word go that this wasn't right. But yet, you know, I continued. Not all that long. I was one of the... Uh, I was one of the people who didn't have a long history in active alcoholism. Uh, I stopped drinking about eight years into the drinking. But along the way, 
I acquired a uh, acquired a girlfriend who became my wife. And I mean, the logic behind that was at the time I thought, well, uh, what I need is someone to uh, stabilize me, someone to settle me down. Now, that's, that's some responsibility to turn around to someone and say, listen, my life's a mess. I want you to help me settle down. You know, I want you to take care of me. Like I was a big lump of a fella, you know. But I want you to take care of me and keep me out of trouble. Uh, now, what kind of responsibility is that? The voice not to another person. But I found a person and she says, I'll have some of that, yeah. I'll take care of you. Any other known members in the room? <laughs> you know, I, I look after you. You know, because, I, and I wasn't a bad boy. I just behaved like a bad boy sometimes. You know, done some things that weren't all that clever. Uh, and again, too, like, I mean, that, you know, it's bad enough in a way choosing a, a woman to be your wife, to stabilize you and take care of you. But when the first child was due, I thought to myself, that'll do it. The child will do it. Once this child comes along, I will, I'll really settle down, you know, because then I'll become a dad. And, you know, the amazing thing is for a guy who had been given the credit of being academically quite gifted, you know, if you listen to me standing in a pub or a club, I tell you, I'm really quite clued up, you know. I mean, at 20, I was managing a, a shop in Belfast. I had staff who were maybe, uh, well, certainly twice as old as me. Not that many, it was three or four. The only thing is I got confused who the money belonged to, uh, you know, <laughs> which uh, I, don't, I don't see the owner here today, so. But, you know, it, it wasn't, it was, and it wasn't something that I was comfortable with. You know, it was something that caused me conflict. Because once I moved outside the barriers of the principles that I had been shown and cultivated in the home as a child, I became spiritually unwell. Now, today I understand that concept. Then I didn't. I didn't know how, to, you know, the spirit was affected by my uh, inappropriate behavior. So that was to come much further down the road when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, when the first child was due, I thought, well, that's it. I'll settle down. And I was looking for a manual. You know, when I get married, I thought the minister should have a manual that said, now, now you're a husband. Now you will behave. This is how you behave as a husband. And you shall turn up every night at 10 o'clock. And you shall bring your wages back to your wife. You know, none of these things. These are all foreign concepts. But yet, once I took a drink, you know, the bit in the big book it talks about, once I took a first drink, I could no longer guarantee my subsequent behavior. And that was my drinking from start till finish. Uh, you know, I believe that as many cameos that we in Alcoholics Anonymous carry with us. These little word pictures inside the brain, and we think, oh, you know when, with me anyway, I think about it, and I kind of wince, mm. and I turn around just in case somebody could read my thoughts, you know, because, oh, I don't want to share that. No, oh, I can't talk about that. Now, that, for me, is spiritual conflict. That's a disalignment with the spirit that I'm born with that tells me the difference between right and wrong. But yet, every time I took a drink, I would wander into areas that was causing me that kind of pain. And the insanity of it was that each time I would say, but that won't happen again. You know, now I'm down here today. It's been a wonderful lunch. Thank you very much. It's, you know, tea, loads of tea and all the rest of it. If I drink that tea... And I experience a blackout. Next time I come here, I end up with drinking any tea, you know, because obviously there's something wrong with the tea. But yet with the alcohol, each time I went into a pub, I looked for a different label that would allow me to drink and not get into trouble. Now, this is a guy who was academically gifted, who, you know, was a manager at the age of 20, who was a bit of a jack-a-lad. You know, a couple of drinks, I could fight better. 
I could sing better. I thought I was a better lover, which we all know is a bit crackers. You know, so, I mean, all these things full of uh, insane behavior. I didn't see it as insane. I thought it was just me growing up. But I remember when I spoke about the cameo, the little cameo, I remember one evening coming into the house and my little girl, who was two then, ran behind us a tea and hid. Little girl, a two-year-old, beautiful, blonde, little child that I loved oh, so much. Today, I love her so much. Thank God she's in my life. But, and the thing is, you see, I'd never abused that child or any of my children, but by the angst that I carried into the house, because if I was having a bad day out there, somebody had to know about it, somebody had to pay. And the payment would be, I'd, you know, strut my stuff into the house. Well, wife, don't you know I had a bad day? Don't you know that, you know, <laughs> I fell out with somebody in the pub where, you know, I had to carry it into the house. But that caused me so much pain, that little girl. Now, that was one of the cameos that brought me into Alcoholics Anonymous. When the second child was due, again, I thought, I was still trying, and I thought, well, two children, I'll really become a dad. But when the child was three months old, the miracle happened. I found Alcoholics Anonymous. So, the miracle of AA was in the happening because I was in conflict with my spirit. My spirit was damaged goods. Every time I went out that door and took a drink, I would finish up in a place that I didn't want to be in my head. I didn't like the people I was with. And I don't know if they liked me at all either. You know. So I was drinking this alcohol. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in Belfast. And, you know, I think to myself, oh, uh, I don't know, the, the last drunk I had up till today was not the worst one. It was one of many kinds of those drunks. You know, five-day drunk, blacked out periods, wrong places, wrong people, wrong cities. <laughs> I mean, I, one night I came back home and I said to the wife, I take a dog for a walk. Now, this is the mother-in-law's poodle. We were responsible for the mother-in-law's poodle. I mean, she really took a chance leaving the poodle with me. So I take a dog for a walk in Belfast, and I finish up in Dublin with the dog. So now it's 11 o'clock on a Saturday night. The following day, <laughs> the phone calls are going, and oh, wow. So I eventually get back into Belfast. And, you know, the dog, the dog is demented. You know, the dog is kind of, as soon as we went into the house and the mother-in-law goes, Oh, Simon's back. Now, you don't call me Simon. This is her dog, you know. The dog is back. Oh, And, you know, it's the sound of the wife, my ex-wife. Uh, I told you not to marry him. Look at my dog, you know. And the poor dog, like, I mean, is, you know, sitting kind of hiding behind his paws. Now, this was me out on a, uh, a kind of goodwill tour, you know, trying to make things better within the family. So I was an irresponsible human being. I was irresponsible as a, as a mature person, as a dad, as a husband. And, uh, you know, so one of many incidents that brought me into Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, that chapter, that portion that we wrote there, uh, that we read uh, today that I chose, you know, every now and again I look at the book and I read a bit about meditation and a vision for you. And they're all wonderful concepts and excerpts from our book. But there's no greater power for me than how it works because that was the bit that took me. These are the steps we took. Not as I used to think, you see, it, it's amazing, you know, at two years sober, I thought I was jack a you know, the shoulders were back and the eyes were sharp, 
and I had a few quid in my pocket again. And, you know, I thought it's time I took my sponsor through the program again, you know, because he's obviously a bit lacking. You know, he doesn't have my sharp intelligence. Maybe Bill Wilson really meant, you know, let's look at step three, John. And McNair would shake his head and he'd say, you got problems, you better settle down. But as I say, with the program, these are steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. Now, me being a clever alcoholic and I was a two years sober, I thought, well, uh, well, it's only a suggestion, John. He says, yeah, true. He says the red stoplights out there when you're driving a car are only a suggestion that you stop. And if you keep driving through them, you're going to get into big trouble. He says exactly the same thing with the program of AA. And believe you, that has been my experience. Because it doesn't necessarily have to finish on a drink. From my coming to the fellowship of AA, I've never needed to take a drink or a drug. But I haven't liked some of the conditions that I've put my head into as a result of uh, self-will run right. Because I also learned in AA that this is a, an illness that manifests itself. Uh, it's a threefold illness, physical, mental, and spiritual. And it's the spiritual which will cause me the despair. You know, the physical bit, we all have bits and pieces as we go along. Uh, you know, we through the strength of this program, I've seen many, many people, uh, one not too far from me, it's had, you know, some heavy-duty stuff. But through the strength of this program, we learn to live, and I have learned to live, with anything that comes along without needing to take a drink. And what a gift that is. So, you know, as life moves on, I uh, finished up in Alcoholics Anonymous and I was talking to Ian and big Paul here from London. And we were just having a cab. And, uh, I heard uh, someone speaking about Clancy there. And I, I know Clancy, obviously, I know him over the years. But for me, the the guy that really uh, triggered off this spiritual energy for me was when I was about two years sober. There was a man called Chuck Chamberlain. Chuck read a book called The New Pair of Glasses. And <coughs> my sponsor said to me, Archie, oh, I'd like you to come down and listen to... Uh, this visiting American. You know, now, we all know at two years sober how busy we can be. You know, we've got a big social calendar, you know. Lots of people wanted me to go to dinner and do loads of things, you know, help them out in many, many sundry ways. Uh, and I said, John, Saturday afternoon's not all that good for me, you know. I mean, there was football on, horse racing, you know, usual, well, usual stuff for me, you know. So he said, well, like, I suggest that you make an effort to come down and listen to this guy. Because if you don't, maybe next time you come banging on my door, I mightn't be as available. And I needed to hear that. Because in those days, there was no mobile phones. I mean, I was eight years sober before I had a landline. And if you wanted to see your sponsor, literally, I went down and banged on his door. I said, John, can I come in? So he says, I suggest you make an effort. And I went down into this room, it was maybe a quarter the size of this here, Saturday afternoon, Belfast. And it was chock a black, and everybody was smoking. In those days, everybody smoked. Well, in A. Abrams, it seemed to anyway. And they all seemed to smoke twice, you know, cigarettes all over the place. So what well done? This guy standing at the mantelpiece, and he's so laid back, like, you know. And he had that wonderful American smile. You know, now, you know, you know his uh, cosmetic dentistry was way ahead of the game then. Like, we're talking about 40-odd years ago, you know. I mean, back home, we still had teeth hanging out of our ears. You know, but uh, this guy, Chuck. So I walked down, and I was, you know, again, too, it's, it's fun to have a gab with a, a friend. You know, it's just sound like... Game. I come in and, you know, we all know how to do the shuffle, you know. So you come in with the shoulders going, you know, 
and the eyes are sharp, and you can't always let this guy see that you're not going to be too easily impressed by him, you know. Because I was a well-traveled guy. I hadn't left Belfast at this point, you know. But I was well-traveled. I was a legend in my own mind. So Chuck was standing there, and he goes, Welcome. And I thought, Welcome? I, he's got some front. I'm down here on a Saturday afternoon giving up my time, and he's welcoming me to my own group. Who does he think he is? The sooner we get him on the plane, the better. Get him back. But the guy spoke, and he created an energy, because I believe for me what has happened to me is that as a direct result of working this program, it's taken me on the other path of learning and uh, spiritual meditation. It has allowed me to tap into the universal energy that I was born with. You know, it doesn't matter what religion uh, anyone is, I believe. I believe that there is an energy that creates recovery, that creates a peace, that creates a, a comfort within our own skin. And that's what I saw portrayed that day. Chuck, as Chuck talked, he wasn't intimidated by me. <laughs> I mean, you know, I came away wanting to touch the hem of the guy's coat, and he became my mentor over the years. He sponsored my sponsor, and he he's a book, not that I'm suggesting any books to anyone, but there's a book that quite often you see on the side table at AA conventions uh, called A New Pair of Glasses. Chuck talks about the freedom, not only the freedom from the first drink, but the freedom to live comfortably on our own skin, to find the spirit that we were born with, because I believe that's what the journey is about. It's about going back to that peace, you know, when we're coming into a loving home. And, you know, as I move on, like, I mean, <coughs> I, uh, I started traveling. I've been in London. I've lived in London longer than I've lived in Belfast. So, I mean, as life has moved on, you know, there's been quite a few changes, different changes here and there. Uh, I have now got three children. Uh, I've got uh, two stepchildren. I've got about ten grandchildren. Uh, and you know the wonderful thing is that they're all a part of my life. And the amazing thing is that, you know, I used to, when Father's Day came along, the first thing I would notice is the card that didn't arrive. Not the cards that had arrived. I would think, what happened to him? Oh, trust him, you know, that's the, the son. He's an accountant. He's too busy to send his dad a car, a card, you know, on Father's Day. And I realized that my job, again, through talking with sponsors, my role is how much do I love them, not how much do they love me. Because love is what I can control. I can't control their love. And it's important for me to keep my side of the street clean. And it's something that on a daily basis, you know, when we talk about the, the program of AA, well, you know, it's uh, every now and again I want to dip into the past. Not, you know, not to take a drink. But, you know, I want to I think, hmm, I think maybe these people think I'm getting a bit soft. You know, I've managed business, sold business. You know, I've been in business for many years. And I think, these people are taking the piss. It's time I started getting out of my prom again. I started, you know, just rattling a few cages. And, you know, that can last maybe a couple of hours. And then I realize, watch your head's not in a good space. You know, this is not your program of recovery. So I find I've got to go back into the, the freedom of letting people be. I let people be. When I came to London, I was just, a, I was particularly, uh, I would jump about a bit here, uh, part of it, I see some of my old friends over 40 years, uh, and you know, <clears throat> when I was saying a few of them turned up to hear me speak, it was only a few, there was about three of them, you know, so... <laughs> Well, it's a delight to see them. And uh, I remember when I first came to London, 
There was only about eight meetings a week in London. And uh, then one of the one of the meeting places we had, there was about five meetings a week in that particular place. And uh, then for some reason we had to get out. I think a tax man caught up with a priest, you know, but we had to move. Uh, no disrespect to any religion at all. But as I say, we... Uh, uh, Chris is down the back there. He used to travel down from Bristol with uh, Travers. And, you know, we were given the commitment from each of our groups to go out and find a new meeting place. And I got involved in the uh, the Monday Mayfair group. And I remember once walking across the road in Oxford Street you know, and it's amazing when you think of it. I live in Wimbledon, and if I get down the West End, I think to myself, oh, good God, I'm in the middle of the city. But, I mean, that's where I used to do all my meetings, and, you know, you'd eat in a coffee bar down there, you'd, you'd go to your meetings. Uh, and if I, if I needed to get home at night, I had to get the all-night bus. I mean, I wasn't driving a, a fancy car, or if, if the bike had lights and mud guards. I thought it was very lawful, you know. So, I mean, it was quite a different uh, quality of life to what I experienced today in the material sense. But, you know, with the meetings, uh, there there seemed to be a wonderful upsurge of recovery in AA. Uh, I think today, and I'm not sure, like I'm no uh, great mathematician on it, but we've probably got about... 100 meetings a night in London, you know. And it was just, uh, when I was asked to come down here to speak, I thought to myself, now, why am I being asked down here to speak? You know, I'm not, I don't see myself as a circuit speaker. You know, yeah, hmm, I'm an old-timer. You know, and, oh, well, old-timers, I mean, you become an old-timer. Uh, <laughs> you don't take a drink and you keep breathing. You know, so like, <laughs> you're an old-timer, big deal. But then you really know you're an old-timer. A girl came to me last week in a meeting, and she was about 35. And she says, oh, you sponsored my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Jesus, you know, oh, yeah, that's so what did. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I mean, it's... <laughs> You just keep coming back, like, you know, you keep coming back and you become an old timer. But I think, I think the, uh, the thing is too that quite often the, the adverse things in AA have been such a wonderful gift to me because it's so easy to get, for me, to get comfortable, caught up in that little cocoon of, you know, family life, uh, business life good relationship, life. Things are wonderful. And then every now and again, you know, you get the odd little slap and you think, hmm, that wasn't too good, you know. Uh, and that's life. You know, that's the bits of life. You see, I used to think of the, uh, the program, you know, when we talk about uh, these are steps we took, you know, I thought, well, yeah, I can give myself a little bit of flexibility there. You know, as long as I don't take a drink. But my head used to tell me, these are steps we took when I was under pressure. But if I take a steps, I don't experience as much pressure. It's not about uh, after the event. It's about working this program and keeping myself clear and free. You know, as I move on, the uh, one of the things that I do like speaking about. I mean, I've got here, and this is a bit of memorabilia that I pulled out the other day. It's a Royal Parish Church of St. Martin's in the Fields. And it's a memorial service to Bill Wilson on uh, Saturday, the 1st of May, 1971. Forty years ago, Bill Wilson died. Uh, and it, you know, it was an amazing event. I still remembered 40 years. I remember the feelings of it. And I was standing in St. Martin's Church 
And I'm no stranger to church. I, as a kid, I had a background of organized religion. I sang in a church choir. I played football for the church, uh, played in the band, tried to join the girl guides, but didn't want to know. Uh, and, you know, I remember standing holding hands with this guy, and there was another guy on the other side. And we're all fairly lived-in characters, you know. One of them looked after a few clubs in Soho. I had been round the block a few times, and the other guy was lived in. And I remember the tears streaming down her face when we said the Serenity Prayer. And I thought to myself, you see, sometimes it's so easy for me just to turn up at my local meeting. I see about 20, 30, 40 people. One of the big meetings I go to, there's maybe a hundred there. But you know, it's good for me sometimes to stand still and look and recognize the wealth of this fellowship and the depth of it. Because this program has touched in its very forms approximately about 20 million people. Alateen, Alanon, AA, NA, all the different people that have used the 12-step program. Now, if this was any other philosophy, let it be in a church, let it be a meditation process, have we been talked on, about on the international stage every day of the week? You know, but because of our principle of anonymity, it is kept fairly low key. And I believe that that is part of our strength. I have no problem whatsoever with that. But sometimes when I look at the vastness of it, I think, <sighs> my sponsor used to say, Archie, if you saw the full canvas now, it would blow your mind away. You know, I just thought I was going to do a bunch of guys in Belfast. And, you know, act strong like myself. I didn't have any idea about how strong this program was. So, I mean, with me it has given me such an understanding, really, of the things that I needed to go into. It took alcohol out of my life. Along the way, I uh, experienced a divorce. Uh, but again, too, through the AA program, that was quite some years in sobriety. But that was something that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a major dramatic thing. It was more like quietly, like shards of glass just falling, you know. And eventually, my ex-wife and I realized that, you know, we didn't have a marriage. And that was it. But again, with this AA program, I was able to deal with it in an ethical way. Today, we have, uh, you know, communication. And I've got the respect of my children. Because my life is an open book. You know, there's no kind of hidden channels. The kids see my life. The kids know who I am. Uh, kids know my partner. We've been together for 16 years. So, she also is a member of the fellowship. And she sends her regrets that she can't be here today. Uh well, because of uh, a funny thing. The other evening, Thursday night, we went out. Uh, I went out. And we've been talking about getting a dog. Uh, I don't know if there's many dog owners here, but, you know, we talked about it for the last couple of years. We must get a dog. You know, because we live near Wimbledon. And we got a lovely big common. You know, and we seemed like a dog was natural. So about a week ago, I said to a couple of mates of mine who are involved in a, a dog walking uh, company, if you know of any dog that's a bit displaced or, you know, not too comfortable looking for a home, let me know. So that was on a week ago. Thursday night, I came back from my uh, home group. I put the key in the door about 11 o'clock. Uh, normally we go for some deed after the meeting. Next thing I hear is dogs running down the passageway. And I'm starting, I thought, oh, I've come to the wrong house. You know, how come my key fits this door? I'm checking to see, oh yeah, that's where I live. You know, so I open the door, two dogs. So careful what you pray for. You know, 
finish up with two talks. Incidentally, one of them's going back again. Uh, so I think we have, you know, and it was, it came from a distressed situation, you know, so I can feel okay about that. We've got a dog and that's okay. But, you know, the wonderful thing is, you see, this program has taken me around so many bits of life, you know. Uh, I was in the World Convention in San Antonio, and I was saying about being nervous, you know. They had me speak in one of the side meetings on a Thursday evening. It was small. There was only a small number there. There was only about a thousand people. So, you know, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't too bad, you know. <laughs> but, you know, when they're doing the serenity prayer at the end, there's about 70,000 people. And we're standing there holding hands. And you see, I, the energy of recovery is so much more than just turning up at meetings. But it's a touching the spirit of recovery. And they listen to that buzz within a, an auditorium such as that. Oh, what an amazing thing. And I need sometimes to stand still and look and see what I've touched into. You know, it's lovely to see all you guys here today. But the magnificence of recovery of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. Brilliant. Also, too, I mean, there's many other kind of treatments that have benefited from the result of Bill Wilson. And, you know, just to roll on, I sponsor a lot of people. And I sponsor because uh, I think there's nothing nicer in life than to have people in your life who trust you, who share with you what's going on in their life. And, you know, I maintain uh, the level of sponsorship that was given to me. And that is that, you know, if people ask me, Archie, would you sponsor me? I say, you don't know me, do you? You know, you hear me speak at a meeting, you hear me speak at a convention. If you want me to sponsor you, find out who you are. Go and talk to Jillian. Go and talk to my partner. She'll tell you what I'm like at home. And then we talk to each other on the phone maybe for a month. And then if it works, then we'll see how it goes. You know, and that, that works very well for me because I believe it's a great privilege. And also, too, I mean, some of the people I sponsor, we go back a long, long time. And they know me like, you know, they know me extremely well. Because I need my peer group to be able to say to me, you know, no one becomes untouchable in recovery. You know, I need my peer group to say to me, Archie, you don't sound too good. Or Archie, where's the program going today? Or Archie, you're off your head. <laughs> doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but, you know, I need to have the people who can pull the choke chain to be able to say, oh, gee, you're not saying too good, man. And you see, life does happen, you know. Life happens. And yeah, about, let's see, four, five, maybe five years ago, I was at the Brighton Convention. And... Uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a wonderful time. We had a great time. And uh, those of you who know me know that I'm blessed with good energy. You know, I, I have a lot of uh, energy and I'm at a convention in particular. You know, I'm out and about and I'm in the middle of it. If there's, you know, singing, I'm in the middle of it. If there's a dance, I'm in the middle of it. Uh, you know, uh, I'm generally involved at some level. But along the way, uh, I started feeling a bit dizzy and thinking, oof, this is not normally how I feel. Uh, and I had some cardio work done about nine, ten years ago. And I said, oh, I better get this checked. So I had an appointment actually booked quite recently, uh, or quite soon after the convention. So I thought, I'll leave it till I get down. I went down and uh, I walked in and, they, you know, technician puts you on a bike and you're doing all your bits. Anyone that's had any cardio investigation, you know what it's like, you know. So he says, well, just quietly sit down. <laughs> and I said, pardon? He says, sit down. 
don't move. I thought, oh, well, now don't get too serious here, you know. <laughs> this is me you're talking about, you know. Uh, I might look like a big lump of a fella, but I get quite frightened when it comes to my well-being. You know, so uh, he says, right. So he rang up and he got through to a guy who knows me quite well. He was a uh, clinic manager over on the other side of the building. So he says, right, put him on a bed. And that was it. Uh, so he put me on the bed. And that was on a Thursday. And, you know, they're checking out all the vitals. And you're lying there and you think, hmm, what's going on here? You know, and the, the head started, my head anyway, starts whizzing. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I need to check this out when I go back home. And I need to do this and I need to do that, you know. I think it's called fear. So, uh this young girl comes along, young nurse, be about early 30s, and she's running all the checks, you know, checking the vitals. Uh, and I wear a, a wear a cross, and I also wear a recovery medal, the triangle within the circle. So the chest is bare, and she's checking the bits, you know. And she says, so oh, what's an interesting medallion there? She says, Do you mind if we ask you what it is? I said, well, it's a recovery medal of Alcoholics Anonymous. She says, oh. She says, I'm a member of AA too. And I said, what? She says, and I'm 10 months sober. She says, and I'm trying to do my fourth step. <laughs> I said, well, hang about. We'll leave your fourth step at the moment. Just check out the bits. <laughs> Just... Just get on with the business at hand here. <laughs> you know, you might need me along the way. <laughs> so, anyway, as it, as it turned out, I mean, that was on a Thursday. Uh, Saturday, I'm out and about, still pick me up, and, you know, back and uh, come out twice as dangerous as what it was. So, I mean, that, that worked okay. Everything's fine. But, you know, the wonderful thing is, you see, what it does for me, it lets me see that I am in a protective bubble when I'm working this program. Out of all the nurses that could have approached me in the middle of Chelsea, one of the biggest hospitals, to come along and say, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, what more proof do you need that there's somebody there looking out for us? And I thought, right. Every now and again, you know, I get these little bits. So as I say, you know, I, I look and I look at, you know, talking about Bill Wilson here. I met Lois in 73 at the Salsi Convention. I think possibly Chris and Sandy might have been there. Uh, and I remember, uh, sorry, Lois, I met Lois. And, you know, I went up afterwards and gave her a hug. And I thought, this is a momentous event. You know, it's not like you're meeting, say, an in-law or a, a sister or sister-in-law or something. This lady was married to the man who was a conduit for Alcoholics Anonymous that helped me live for all these years. And when I looked at it, and I looked at the whole background to it. I mean, the information. You know, alcoholics have been on earth from the crushed grapes. You know, and they used to put people like me, I don't include you, they'd put me in the lunatic asylums. You know, they'd, they'd leave me lying in the gutter. Victorian times, how many people's lives were wrecked and ruined. Alcohol, only the grape. And then along came, forced off the Washingtonians. They had the message of recovery too, but it was changed in a way that didn't really fit in with the alcoholics' acceptance. Then came the Oxford groups, and again too, they got involved in different things. So the message was diluted or distorted. I believe, and this is my little homily, that at some point, you know, when Bill had that spiritual awakening, that, you know, 
he looked down at one point, my heart power, and said, look, I'm fed up with you guys. I've given you three messages here, and you've done nothing with it. And here it comes, you know, bang. And, you know, Bill became the conduit for Alcoholics Anonymous. And he suffered the human condition till the day he died, but he never took a drink. And it was that that I needed. I needed humanity to help me restore me to humanity. So it's important for me that I look at this wonderful concept of AA. <clears throat> and just to come down to a close now, you know, when I look at the uh, magnificence of this program, uh, you know, I think most of us know that you know, we had a wonderful little euphemism back home in Belfast, you know. We we got a little bit of trouble going on, you know. <laughs> a little bit, little bit of trouble, you know, which went on for about 35 years. And, you know, buildings were closed. Uh, corporations were closed. Restaurants were closed, you know. Uh, but within AA... The lights never went out. No matter where you went. I mean, I would sometimes when I go home, and I mean, I wouldn't be back home and in the middle of it the way the other guys were. But every now and again, I'd finish up in the part of the city. And I'd think, this looks a bit hairy, you know. What am I doing here? You know, but if it was on a 12-step car, it was okay. And I mean, this is something too that AA grew continued to grow as a result, I believe, of this uh, energy of Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's not something that I can put a price on because it has given me it has given me the ability to live. Today I'm forty seven years sober. And Now, and if I reach September, God willing, or before the eight years sober, you know. But I mean, off me, I'm not capable of that. You know, I thought about suicide when I was a, a kid in my twenties. I came into AA in my twenties. I was the first young batch of kids to come into the fellowship. You know, so this this message of recovery today, if there's only one and any doubts, and believe you me. I haven't sold myself short and living. There's people about here who know me. I live a very full life, a good quality life. You know, I'm in a position to travel anywhere I feel like it, basically. But it's just been the result of recovery and this program. So, today, I would just say that uh, anyone in any doubt or anyone in Al-Anon or al you know, if you have anyone out there thinking that uh, maybe it'll work for them, may not work for me, all you need to do is keep turning up. What I'd like to do, just in closing, dedicate this to those about may, may have heard a guy called Ernie C. from Belfast. Ernie died about two years ago. And often, Ernie and I would share a platform. And one of the prayers that Ernie used to leave with you, and I would like to repeat it and dedicate it to him. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rain fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.